Hello, welcome back to Tiny Artist TV and welcome to the first video of 2021. So this is actually going to be a continuation of the series that I've been working on for the past month or so called Consider the Basics, where I take basic building blocks from art, break them down, help you guys understand them more easily if you're just starting out, or as a refresher course for those of us who've been doing this for a while and maybe just need a reminder of why the things we do work so well. So for today's video, we're gonna be looking at color, color theory, and picking color palettes that are harmonious and easy to look at. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Now, before we dive too far into the swimming pool of all the beautiful colors of the world, we'll go over some quick vocabulary. Not that you necessarily need to know these terms by heart, but I will be using them to describe how colors relate to each other. So our first term is hue, which is just the color itself. And then I'm also gonna be discussing tint, tone, and shade. So a tint is a hue that has been mixed with white. A tone is a hue that has been mixed with gray. And a shade is a hue that has been mixed with black. So now that we understand this, Let's go ahead and see what it looks like with color versus grayscale. Here's a color palette that I made for today's video using a palette generator, which I will also discuss later in the video. But here we can see our hue, which is this medium yellow. And then we can see where white has been added, where gray has been added, and where black has been added to create the different colors in the gradient. And now it's time to look at some colors. As you can see here, there are many different palette types. So we're gonna split them into basically two groups. So monochromatic and analogous kind of go together in one group and analogous is a more complete or more complex version of a monochromatic color palette. And then our compound color palettes are gonna be the complementary, the compound, the triadic, and the tetradic. Square is another one, but it's basically just a perfect version of a tetradic color combination. So you're probably most familiar with monochromatic. It's usually talked about in grayscale or when you want to use a simplified color palette. And it involves just what we saw earlier, which is the hue mixed with tints, tones, and shades of that hue. An analogous color palette can pretty much be like a monochromatic color palette, but you're adding the two neighboring colors to it, such as if you wanted to go with, say, sky blue. You can add dark blue and then a lighter green, and then you'll have an analogous color palette. It's basically any set of colors that are touching each other, whether it's three colors or up to seven colors. And chromatically, a rainbow is considered an analogous color palette because all of the colors are touching each other, more or less. Our next color palette is complementary, and you may have some experience with complementary colors or complementary color palettes, with the complementary color set being anything that's diametrically opposed on the color wheel. So as far as primaries and secondary colors are concerned, which primaries being red, blue, yellow, and your secondaries being green, purple, and orange, they're gonna pair off opposite the color wheel. So your complementary pairs, as we see on here, are red and green, and then you also have purple and yellow, and our third combination being blue and orange. And usually you see complementary color palettes being used for school colors because they're very bold and noticeable against each other, and that's what you wanna see across the field or on any kind of logos or memorabilia, things of that nature. Color combinations that are gonna catch your attention. So for compound, it's a little bit like an analogous color palette had a baby with the complementary color palette. So you can see in the spacing here, you're still using two colors that are one space apart from each other, and then one color that is more or less diametrically opposed to that center color. It's the best way I can think of how to describe it. So in the example, we see um, red, violet, orange, and then the green that's across from the red that would have made up the analogous color palette. So in another example, if we want to look at the color wheel here, it would be, let's say, that golden orange, 
the lemon yellow, and then across from that would be the true violet if you wanted to use that combination to make a compound color palette. Triadic, it's just gonna be any color combination that is equidistant from each other on the color wheel. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the hue. Again, tints, tones, and shades do come into play when picking color palettes. These are just specifically for selecting hue. And then you're also going to consider tints, tones, and shades when looking at things like lighting, shading, textures. But to pick your base colors to start from, this is where you're going to start. And then you have tetradic, which is just two pairs of complementary colors. So we can see here there's red and green, which are one of our complementary pairs. And then we also have the yellow and purple, which is another set of complementary colors. Now, as I mentioned, um, square is another one. So if this was a square palette, it's essentially like a triadic, but it's a perfect tetradic. So it would be instead of red, green, purple, and yellow, it would be red, green, orange, and, okay, not orange, orange. If you're looking at the screen here, the orange, yellow, that's just above the yellow, and then directly across from it, that purple. So I guess it's more like true violet and true yellow versus lemon yellow and ultraviolet. Splitting hairs, I know, but we're going based off of what we have on the screen here. Now, this is all well and good when you're working with analog products like colored pencils, markers, even scrapbooking paper, and you don't have a palette generator to make the palette for you. But fortunately, modern technology exists and there are plenty of color palette generators out there. So the first part was basically just to explain how these color palettes are generated and their relationships to each other. but. Now we're gonna get into the beauty of color palette generators. So if you've seen any of my Saturday morning shuffles, you've seen me use this website before. I love this website when I'm doing videos here versus on my phone. I do also have a palette generator on my phone. It's just called palettes and you can save as many palettes as you want to, name them, add colors, take colors away. And most palette generators will have a generate method which has the listed palettes that we talked about. So if you didn't have a color wheel sitting next to you or any prior knowledge, now you understand what these terms mean. So we've got our monochromatic and analogous, which are limited color palettes, or complementary, which are gonna be our diametrically opposed color palettes, split complementary, triadic, tetradic, and square. So, if you need a refresher, you can go back about five minutes just to look back at that. But we're gonna look at some color palettes now. So let's say I wanna try out a color palette, something that's gonna be bold and striking and it's gonna have colors that work together but are not even necessarily touching on the color wheel. And that's gonna make a very dynamic color palette for my characters if I'm doing costume design or hair, anything like that. So as you can see here, the color palettes I'm generating are very um, noisy. This I wouldn't necessarily consider it a harmonious color palette even though it is a triadic based on where the colors fall on the color wheel, color spectrum, whatever you want to call it. But this green next to this blue, it's very... This is a color palette you would find on an animal in nature that's telling you not to eat it because it's poisonous. Let's just put it that way. But if we want to look for more harmonious color palettes, I tend to default to the analogous and just because it provides you with tints, tones, and shades, and also colors that are next to each other, which are usually more aesthetically pleasing. In the last segment of today's video, we're going to look at color temperature and how color temperature affects the overall mood or presentation of your character. So we have our warm colors and our cold colors. Warm colors being anything that's gonna be in the lighter violets down to the yellows and our cooler colors are gonna be more of true greens and blues and purples. Now what's not included in here are neutrals. 
So white and black are not technically colors because one is the absence of pigment and one is the absolute value of all the pigments combined. And even a lot of browns and grays are usually lighter versions of orange and blue. So with color temperature in mind, let's look at how color palettes can affect your character's presentation. We're gonna use the same character and just look at it with different palettes. And tell me how you feel in the comments about each character's palette. For these examples, I used my character Sarah Feist, and she's a character that's going to be in an upcoming project that I'm going to be working on, uh, time permitting. <laughs> it's not going to be coming out anytime soon, but I will be working on it in the midst of also doing these videos. Anyway, so Sarah here, as you can see, I've got three different versions of the same character. In the original, she's very mellow, more muted, burgundy, brown, warm-ish tones. And then I picked random color palettes from other characters that she would probably never wear just based on her personality. So the cool tone version, I actually really like, but you can kind of see in the cool tone version, personality wise, she somehow looks a little more mischievous versus the warm tone version. She looks so much happier. Like, she looks like you would find her just out in a field of flowers somewhere. And there's a lot of character creators who kind of do this. If they want to evoke a particular emotion towards a character, they just make them that color because of ingrained character color association. Like, red is usually associated with passion and not necessarily like love passion, but like passionate anger, danger, whereas blue characters are usually perceived as more calm, more mellow, because things that are blue, like water, the sky, are all things you associate with calming environments, whereas again, yellow is associated with happiness, joy, celebration. So when you're designing your characters, think about how you want them to be perceived like what is their personality what would they wear maybe their outfit doesn't necessarily match their personality but as far as sarah is concerned she is a more mellow character and so her color palette in the original is more muted here's some more examples of characters from the same universe of the project that's being worked on so this is scopa and her color palette is very bright, very vivid, very... It's got a lot of energy to it because she is a character that comes from a place that loves color, that loves life, celebration, and everything is very colorful. Everything is hand dyed. And on the other hand, we have Urzabet. Urzabet comes from a place that is very focused on scholarly pursuit. They're very tactical, very analytical, they love reading, they love discovering, and her design and her color palette and the color palette of her entire planet is very blue. Not quite a calm blue, it's a more academic, more stern blue. And you can see that in her design in that everything is very calculated angular, symmetrical, and all of the blues, there's not a lot of variance because the focus isn't on the outfit. Even though the outfit does dictate her station, the color does not dictate her station. And so everyone kind of has the same color palette. The last example we have is a deer. <laughs> and he actually comes from a place where your clothing does also dictate your station, but also based on the color of your clothing dictates whether you're high class or low class and is more based on Eastern imperialism where you could tell a peasant from a noble just based on clothing type, designs, colors, things of that nature. So lower class citizens tend to have very colorless garb and the entire environment 
It's very black and white and gray and kind of dim and dismal. And they focus a lot on justice and not so much might makes right, but that this is the law and you must follow the law to the T. And so to symbolically, I guess literally <laughs> represent that, their environment is black and white with very little gray. Like there are some, the designs are in gray to differentiate from the black and white of their robes, but everything is very stark, very straight. And it's actually very similar to the previous character's environment but the difference being emphasis on justice and judiciary systems versus emphasis on exploration and knowledge pursuits. So I hope these tips were helpful in helping you guys pick your color palettes and helping you guys decide how you want to determine what your characters will end up looking like. In the next video, we'll look at putting your character in an environment and how to set up a portrait versus setting up a landscape. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'll see you guys next time. Have a weird day.